Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Boost Your Biology podcast. Today, I have a very special guest um, in with me. We're going to be talking all things anti-aging. Um, and I've been really looking forward to this episode because, you know, I came across um, this particular website and a lot of the products that um, Phil, um, you know, uh, lists on the site, I'm very you know, very impressed by and I'd love to learn more about them. So thank you for joining in today, Phil. Absolute pleasure, Lucas. Absolute pleasure. And uh, even though we're halfway around the world, it's it's great to hook up and, and talk, you know, because in these strange times that we have where we literally are not allowed to meet one another, you know, these webinars are a terrific way to share information and get to know people. Exactly, exactly. So maybe we'll start out by like letting my listeners know a little bit about yourself um, because obviously um, a lot of them are pretty much unfamiliar with like uh, peptides and um, anti-aging. So do you want to give my listeners a little bit of an introduction into yourself and the company? Okay. Well, that's very kind of you to do that. Um, I am the co-founder of International Anti-Aging Systems. We started the organization in 1991. So I think we're one of the pioneers in this field because although the name anti-aging is generally known by most people these days, I can assure you that nearly 30 years ago, um, we'd sometimes be laughed out of a room when uh, when they would say to us, so what do you do? And we'd say, well, we're really interested in combating this thing called aging. Um, so that's, that's, that's the story there. I can give you a little bit more in a second. About me, personally, um, I... I uh, came out of um, school and I went in and I did a what was then known as food and vitamin technology uh, in 1981 and um, today would be called nutrition. <laughs> uh, it's quite strange to use uh, how far, it doesn't seem that far back but it, it, the terminology was different. I went on from that to do a bachelor's in pharmacy and I spent a little bit of my time in pharmacology which is the development of drugs. And then I did a master's degree in biochemistry. Um, but really, if I'm perfectly honest, my experience, uh, because this is such a, a new and evolving and changing field, new ideas are coming and going all the time, uh, that really my experience over 30 years has been meeting with the VIPs, as I like to call them, the, the, we might say the maverick doctors, uh, but we need mavericks if we want to push the envelope, I always say. Um, and going to meetings all over the world and reading. And because I'm the editor of the Aging Matters magazine, uh, which is a magazine for the public, which is a quarterly uh, magazine, uh, and I'm also um, assistant editor of the uh, Lifespan Medicine Journal, which is an online medical journal for doctors. Uh, that's with Dr. Thierry Hertog, who's one of the world's great endocrinologists, um, from, from Belgium, and um, so you can imagine that journal is focused on hormones. Yeah. Um, so, and I've met many of the greats in the industry. I've, I, that's one of the honors I've had in my time. There's a few people I wish I'd met, and I unfortunately are no longer with us, and I've not had the chance, but most of the people in the industry are nice people. Um, they're open-minded people. They tend to have a libertarian attitude, which I like, um, because, you know, you know, if you want to get into this, you've got to believe in the freedom of choice yeah. because we are, if you will, at the top of the pyramid. I, I can explain my concept of the optimal health pyramid a little, bit, a little bit later if you want me to. So, but what we do, what is anti-aging medicine? Because some people love the term, some people hate the term. So a little thing about that, what it fundamentally means, it's preventative medicine, and at its best, it's regenerative medicine. Mm. So we want to prevent diseases, obviously. Nobody wants to get cancer or heart disease or anything like nasty like that. And on the other side of the coin, if we have a, a bit of a problem occurring or a bit of an issue, we want to regenerate. Mm. I'm shy away from using the word rejuvenate, but that's the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is we'd like to go back in time mm. physically, physically, because maybe sometimes people say, what age would you like to be, Phil? And I say, gee, that's a real hard question to answer because mentally and experience and all those other things that come with age, I want to be as old as I am now, which is nearly 59. But, 
you know, physically, yes, I perhaps would like to go back to my 20, when I was 25. Um, so when people say that, I think there's a physical age and then there's a mental age. They're, they're quite different. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, so um, obviously I wanted you to sort of give a little bit of insight into a range of, you know, some of your products on your site because I'd flagged a few of them because they really stood out to me and I can see that they have huge therapeutic potential. Um, so I guess maybe we can start out by um, having a little discussion about some of the bioregulators. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So do you want to give... Yeah, sure, Lucas. Was, yeah. A absolute pleasure. If I, if I may, if I just countenance this, with, give me 15 seconds. I wrote an article recently, which was published in a couple of places, which was entitled, Can AI Save Us? Can artificial intelligence save us? And my point of that article was, do you know right now, today, there are 25,000 PubMed journals. These are recognized as the cream of the crop, you know. Uh, I mean, if you take it, all the other magazines and things is an enormous number. But if we take PubMed, which, which most doctors would say is the gold standard, um, there are 25,000 PubMed journals today, and they produce 1.5 million articles every year between them. Can you imagine what, you know, that's every year. Now go back 50, 100 years and try and read the rest of it. No human being can keep up with it. No group of human beings can keep up with it. And lurking within all that published information are amazing things. I hope we'll touch on some of them that I know mm -hmm. today, mm -hmm. and peptides will be the first of those. Yeah. And so I always say, actually, we don't need to discover anything new. An amazing amount of stuff has been discovered, but it's not been learned because we don't know. It. My joke on stage when I present, have you seen this publication? There's an amazing consequence. Have you seen this one? That's, that's got incredible. And people sometimes say, wow, it's in, why don't we know about this? And I say, well, if you want to keep it a secret, publish it. Because one and a half million articles a year, you know, it's, it's impossible to keep up with it. Yeah. So peptides, as we want to get into now, um, are, this is quite a long story. I'll, I'll shorten it as much as I can, but it is one of the most incredible stories that, that I know of in recent times. It is, it is, it was, I should say, a former secret of the Soviet Union, okay? Now, I've been lucky enough, um, I actually have some Russian um, uh, parentage uh, background, so I've been lucky enough, I've been over to Russia a few times, and I've got to know the people at the Petrov Research Institute in St. Petersburg. It's one of the most beautiful cities in the world that, to go and visit, so it's a great place to go. And despite whatever they told us during the Cold War, Russian people are very warm and charming people, as, as everybody is, right? <laughs> as the old adage says, I'm, 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 I'm proud of my country, but ashamed of my government. Now, we can all say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, anyway, that's by the by. And um, so 40 years ago, under the Soviet Union, uh, the, the, this particular man, who today is Professor Vladimir Kavinson, and he's the top professor in, in, in Russia, mm -hmm. sits on so many boards. Mm -hmm. he, um, he was, believe it or not, he was in the KGB medical corps and he received a phone call from the Kremlin. This was in the early 80s. And they basically said that, that the Americans had developed new battlefield weapons. They had developed a laser that would blind everybody and other things like and very nasty things that go on in, in, in the military. And they said to him, go and find stuff that can fix our troops. The other thing they said, and this was really interesting actually, because it's almost the first government mandated anti-aging medicine. Um, they said, we've got boys who are sitting on the bottom of ocean floors next to nuclear reactors on the submarines and sitting in silos by missiles, you know, again, nuclear, who are aging fast. Well, it's not really a surprise if you're going to be around radiation, right? That's not a surprise. But they wanted to try and protect them. So they said to him, go and find something. And he had the resources of the Soviet Union at his disposal. He said to me once, he said, if this was now, I couldn't do it. Because, you know, I, I could literally pick the phone up and say, I want this, I want that, I want anything. And of course, it was the Kremlin, so they got it. Um, now, they went down some blind alleys. Obviously, it was the research, but they stumbled upon 
short chain peptides, which today we refer to as bioregulators. Now, what are short chain peptides? Well, they're in foods, they're in different foods, obviously, different peptides in different foods. And a short chain peptide is identified as, because peptides are made of amino acids. You know, everything from hormones to proteins to peptides to amino acids, they're all amino acids. It's just how long is this chain, okay? So if we took, let's say, growth hormone as an example, which I'm sure perhaps many of your listeners are familiar with, you're looking at 191 amino acids. That's a very long, and as a result, very fragile type of molecule. But as you start to shorten them, you get down to various different proteins and then peptides. So a peptide can be two amino acids. So something like L-carnosine, for example, is a dipeptide, two amino acids. From two to six is a short chain amino acid, okay? And that's what we're talking about now. We're talking about these short chain, which as I say, are being referred to now as bioregulators. And they're, they're actually very stable. It's only when they get longer than that that they, they can be cleaved. The obvious one is stomach acids. You go swallow it, it's gonna break down. And there's a nice story there, which I'll, I'd like to tell you about steaks and things, and a little bit of confusion about what survives in the stomach and what doesn't survive in the stomach. Yeah. But the Russians have done countless studies, clinical studies, amazing studies. So they were making these short chain peptides for their military. They realized that they're gene switches. So that's a profound statement that I've just made, because a lot of pharmaceutical companies, they would give their back teeth to have a drug that acted like a specific gene switch. So for example, if we take that fast forward into the future, if we know that that particular gene is a cancer gene and can cause cancer, we can silence it with a short chain peptide. Yeah. On the other hand, if we know that this gene over here is an anti-cancer gene, we can switch it on mm. with a short chain peptide. Mm. So, and genes are, in, they're either on or off. There's, there's no middle ground. It's like a fax machine. It's either on or it's off. There's, you know, that's it. No choice. Yeah. Um, so that's a fundamental statement. So they started giving their elite troops, their um, Olympic team, <laughs> their cosmonauts, yeah. uh, these, and it's in the public domain now. What I'm talking about is not no longer a military secret. Mm -hmm. They've published literally dozens and dozens, I think over 48 big, profound, uh, studies in English in English they've been they've been translated um, and we've written I've helped to write two books I've helped to write a scientific book about it you can find these on amazon.com which is a heavy-duty book I, I fully admit but it is the science behind it so if people don't believe it and they want to read it and that's called uh, uh, peptides in the epigenetic control of aging okay which I, I love that title. I think it really says it all. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then there was a public book, which is a nice book. It's a booklet, really. You could easily read it in, a, in an evening. Um, and that's called um, The Peptide Bioregulate, Bioregulator Revolution. Okay. Um, so now today, they've got 21 of these um, uh, different, uh, that they've released anyway. Mm -hmm. And in Russia, the oral versions are sold as food supplements. And the um, uh, the injectables, of course, are, are designated as medicines because of the nature of the administration. Um, but nonetheless, I, there are some amazing stories. I could I could go off into all sorts of different directions for you here mm -hmm. on what these things can do. Just to touch on one, and then I'll let you ask me what you want to know. <laughs> um, just to touch on one, the pineal peptide mm -hmm. is a very unique one and a very important one. Again, I could go off on about the pineal gland if you want me to. I've worked with yeah, some. Feel free, feel, feel free to Phil. This is um, yeah, this is profoundly fascinating. So please. Well, talk. thank you. I, I hope I'm on track for you. And if I'm not, please tell me, and I'll be happy to change, change, or shut up for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, but I'm a bit of a raconteur, and I'm aware, I'm aware of that. Um, so the pineal gland is this strange gland. It's right in the centre of our brains. And it's not quite the top gland. The hypothalamus is the top, the absolute top gland. Some people think it's a gravity-fed endocrine system. But the pineal gland 
basically only produces melatonin, yeah. this, this one hormone that I think a lot of people are aware with. And a lot of people think of melatonin as a supplement, and it's freely available in the United States, of course, no, no prescription required, go down to your local, you know, wherever and buy it. And um, people think, oh, it's a sleep, it's for your sleep. Well, that's partly true, but if people are thinking it's like a sleeping drug, they've got it wrong. Melatonin will not make you sleep. What it will do is when you go to sleep, you'll have much better sleep, okay? But there's something really fundamental going on because hormones, all the different hormones, although most of them are released first thing in the morning, you know, in, in big numbers, in, in, big, in the big pulse safe production, like growth hormone, yep. most of it is produced in, you know, in the morning. And it's the kind of get up and go stuff, right? Because, you know, oh, I want to wake up, I want to wake, you know, but I've got to get, get up and do something. But that's not to say that different hormones aren't produced at other times of the day, perhaps in smaller, in smaller amounts. So how does our bodies, how do our bodies know what time it is to release hormone X, Y, or Z? They know because of melatonin, because melatonin is produced in the pineal gland at night time. That's oh, it's night time. No, if you switch all the lights off in the room, and you know people start to feel sleepy, right? Yeah. Because your brain is starting to produce melatonin. Oh, it must be night time. Um, and so what happens is that gives us a signal to the other hormones when they should come out. Okay. So the term is hormonal cyclicity. Okay. So by using melatonin. And it normally takes up to three months. People, if people think they're going to get a fantastic result in two or three days, uh -uh. but if you keep it out for three months, you will see great results. And if you read any of the clinical trials about what melatonin can do, you normally find that at three months, the big stuff starts to happen. So, and I'll touch on that if you want me to. Yeah. So the hormone also now if you if the if your body's on the right time zone as it were you've now got hormonal cyclicity when you've got hormonal cyclicity you have a very strong immune system yeah so that's the secret to melatonin okay it was once put to me like this by a great man a lovely man uh, dr walter pierre Pauli from italy who's written a lot on melatonin he's one of the world's great melatonin researchers and of course, he has that lovely Italian accent that is so nice to our ear because it sounds like music even when they're talking. So forgive me, but I like to say it. So he says, uh, he says, a, a fill is a, a melatonin is like a conductor of orchestra because with orchestra, you, uh, if you have no conductor, you have a just noise. But when you have a conductor, you have music. So it's a great way to think about what melatonin does and what the pineal does. So let's go back a step to the peptide. Mm. So if you take the pineal peptide, it in naturally, it's a gene switch, it tells your pineal gland to wake up and start producing more melatonin. And so it's a different way. So I could say it in a legal perspective, I, I think Australia, um, forgive me, if, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, please Lucas, but my country in the UK, we have to have a prescription to go and get melatonin. I'm guessing you might have to in Australia as well. Exact same, um, but we can still, if, if you really wanted to get your hands on it, you can get your hands on it like online, so yeah. Sure, well, we, there's a lot of illicit substances just like that as well. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but I know what you mean, I know what you mean. Um, but here's the good news. The pineal peptide is a food supplement. Yeah. So here we've got something that we know will help in this particular case, specifically to make the pineal work better. Mm. But there's another thing they now know about this pineal peptide, which is a hot topic. It extends our telomeres. Wow. It extends our telomeres. Wow. And we now know this. Okay. This is now a fact. Now it's a very little known fact, but Remember, when the Russians were playing with these things in the 1980s and 1990s, people weren't really knowing about telomeres then, and they certainly didn't have tests then that could find out. It's only in the last 10, 15 years that laboratories have come forward saying we've got telomere tests. And there's still not many of those in the world, but they are around. So you probably know, I'm sure very well, that if we extend telomeres, we could extend all kinds of things. We could even extend lifespan, okay? Now we don't know that in humans because people haven't lived that long, but when it's, if it's in rats or mice or 
fruit flies or worms? Certainly, yes, absolutely. But perhaps even more importantly than that, we extend the quality of life. You know, the rats are sexually uh, active right up into what would be very old age for them, you know, uh, and, and also it's a protective against cancer. There's a whole story there. Some people say, oh, no, long telomeres, um, they would cause cancer because cancer have long telomeres, right, in the cancer cells. But the reason they have long telomeres is they're protecting themselves. That's why the buggers don't die. You know, that's why it's so, so difficult to, to get rid of cancer. But telomeres fundamentally, normally, I think, are, are, are very protective. Um, and if anyone doesn't know, they're the strands on the end of the chromosomes. And a nice way of thinking about it, I told you I was a storyteller, nice way of thinking about it is uh, aglets. And the aglets are those little bits of plastic on the end of your shoelaces. And if, they, if those little bits of plastic on the end weren't there, the shoelace would be a mess, right? It would be just all frayed. It's exactly the same with chromosomes. It, the telomeres literally hold them together. So they, think of them as the aglets for chromosomes. So, the bits of, so they're very, very helpful, very useful. And of course, there's lots of books, there's lots of prominent people in the field now who are writing about telomeres. So the pineal peptide, I would say, is, a, is one at the top of the list. An incredible study that has never been done, to the best of my knowledge, in the Western world was done in the Soviet Union in the early 90s. They took, um, in fact, I think it was 1990, they took uh, 12,000, no, I beg your pardon, it was, no, let me get this right. They took 2,000 people and they studied them for 12 years. And who were these 2,000 people? They were ordinary people, ordinary men and women who worked in a company, a government company called Gazprom. And Gazprom are Russia's biggest, or they were then, uh, oil and gas company. Okay. So these people had all kinds of jobs, outdoor jobs, indoor jobs, you know, you can imagine. Break, break, broad section. And they put them in age groups. And none of them were young. And nobody was sort of like 25. Were, everyone was like, you know, 40, 50, 60. And, and they put them in these different groups. And they gave one group, one group they gave uh, vitamins, which were kind of placebo effect. Another group they gave the pineal, pe just the pineal peptide. Another group they gave just the thymus peptide. And another group they gave just the blood vessel peptide. And a fifth group they gave uh, um, all three peptides. Every single peptide group had a major decrease in mortality and all kinds of improvements across the board. But the ones that took all three of those peptides, they had half the mortality of any other group. So now at that time, I'm pretty sure, now at that time they had no method of, and they didn't measure telomeres. I'm convinced now, knowing the studies that are going on, there's a study going on right now in the United States conducted by Dr. Bill Lawrence, lovely man, and he has 39 patients in this trial, and he's following them over three years, and they're using various peptides, but they're all using the pineal peptide. And he's halfway through that trial. We hope to report on this in the Aging Matters magazine. He's already told me of the early results. Significant increases in telomere length on everybody, on everybody. So how about that? It's a good start. Oh man, it's phenomenal. Yeah, I mean, it's it's getting me all excited. Um, just, just learning about this this particular peptide. Um, so obviously, this is just one of the twenty one that this um, this Russian um, researcher. What was his name again? Vladimir. Vladimir Kavinson. Yeah, yeah. So, what else are we seeing, like, um, from your experience with this particular the pineal peptide? What are people experiencing? Yeah, it's, uh, well, surprise, surprise, better sleep. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, it may not be a big surprise, but better sleep is an amazing, amazing thing. Now, during our REM, you know, this rapid eye movement, uh, which is the time we dream, okay, uh, there's a lot of hormone release going on when, when that happens. In fact, they say if you wake someone up, you, you only remember dreams, apparently, if you're woken up. You, it could be just for a second or two. You're still lying in bed. You're still, you know, you're still dopey. You still want to sleep. But that's how we remember dreams. So if apparently they, you know, they've woken people up after REM. Hey, did you have a dream? Don't remember. They wake people up during REM and they go, oh, yeah, I was just dreaming about 
whatever, you know. Um, so, so there's a lot going on when that's happening. So, but the thing about, the, there's a little statistic that most people don't know, and it's quite frightening. Well, it's frightening or interesting, whichever way you want to look at it. And that is that the brain has to have this sleep to repair itself. You know, neurons are firing, they're firing all the time. But I mean, particularly when we're awake and doing webinars, we're, we're firing more neurons than, than when we're, you know, I don't know, sitting in a garden with a gin and tonic, uh, whatever. Uh, <laughs> um, so the brain needs this sleep time to actually do a lot of repairs on neurons. A lot of damage has happened. A lot of free radical reactions have taken place. Mm. Now, the universal energy molecule that everything we do, everything we, everything we move, every, I end up thinking it ends up like a bloody sting song. Every thought you make, every neuron you break, you know, <laughs> you know that one of his, um, is, um, is fired. So it uses ATP and then as iron triphosphate yep. to do the repair. I was told once, and I've no reason to deny it because the guy who told me was a, was a real expert in the field, that the brain can use more ATP asleep trying to repair than if you'd run a marathon that day, wow. right? That's, the brain is an incredibly hungry thing. It only weighs about two or 3% of our body weight, okay? but it's consuming half of the blood sugar, 20% of the oxygen we breathe, and a very significant amount of blood supply goes through the brain as well. So it's, for its size, it is, an, it is the most demanding organ that we have. It's perhaps not a big surprise, but that's why it needs. So now you begin to understand why sleep is so important. You have to repair your brain. Yeah. Right. And we all know that if we miss two or three days sleep, we feel pretty rotten, pretty rotten. So getting a good night's sleep, and it does come back to this thing I said earlier. Once we've got this hormonal cyclicity, this is why people who do shift work or do a lot of, uh, you know, if you're flying to London, you know you're not going to feel too good when you get to London. It's going to take, they reckon every hour time difference around the world under normal circumstances, your body needs a day. So I imagine that you and I are probably sharing a 10 or 12 hour time zone difference. So imagine if I fly out to see you, you've got to give me 12 days to come and see you to be normal, yeah. right? But yeah. Probably I'll be flying home after a week, so I'll never be on the right time zone. But melatonin, if you use it three days before your travel, or the pineal peptide, Although the pineal peptide needs longer to get to this position. Right. So in this case, you'd be better off just using pure melatonin for jet lag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can hit the ground running. And a little tip, use melatonin between the hours of 9 p.m. and 11 p.m. Doesn't matter whether you go to bed or not, okay? You can go to bed at midnight if you really want to. But if you do that, you should release most of the melatonin into your blood between 1 a.m. and 3 a.m., which is when it's naturally naturally at its highest right. and this is the other thing about hormones that makes them more difficult it's not only using the right molecule in the right dose and timing timing and that is an advantage of the peptides okay because it is not forcing the release of a hormone it is through the genes so it's a natural so we, we might talk later about growth hormone releasing peptides so if you inject yourself with growth hormone, just as an example, you get what's called a bolus um, uh, release. So you just, obviously, you inject yourself with something. Bang, if you were doing the blood, whoa, there it is. Whoosh, there it goes. Okay. Well, that's not what we would call bioidentical. If we were monitoring our growth hormone levels day and night, we would see that in the morning there was a significant spike and then it went down, and then in the afternoon, there'd be another little spike, and then there might be another, there's about seven spikes of growth hormone, and then bang, it's morning again, okay? But it's very different to this bolus injection that we took, okay? So the injections are not bioidentical, and we have a bit of a downer on the patches in the organization. Uh, my medical director is a guy called Dr. Ward Dean, and Ward hates, um, uh, patches and the reason it is is it's a constant release so if you took a testosterone patch for example 
and you had it you know implanted into your backside which they often are um you know you're not going to create a natural increase what you're going to do is you're just going to give yourself this flat line of testosterone now you might feel good you might feel very energized and other things but you might also accelerate your aging okay so it might be a short-term gain for a long-term loss um some people might be very happy with that well that's that's their choice you know that's that's the libertarian choice pays your money takes your choice um but the nice thing about peptides is they are improving the natural pulse site so if you took a a growth hormone releasing peptide you'd see a natural increase across the board and that is a lot safer yeah yeah um i really would love to touch on because obviously we've just spoken about um supporting sleep another huge issue that i see a lot of clients suffering with and um, even athletes and things like that is adrenal fatigue and i know there's a particular bioregulator that you guys sell that's exceptionally um, beneficial for regulating that adrenal and normalizing yeah. that cortisol response. So do you want to yeah, discuss absolutely. a bit more? Absolutely. Yeah, absolute pleasure. Um, yes, this is the adrenal. I'm, I'm avoiding all the, um, the, the names of these peptides um, because it gets complicated. I mean, I'll be happy to, to, to trot them out if you want me to, but I'm just sticking to, so we, even in the, this is the adrenal peptide. Yeah. Um, we're talking about now that because the Russians give them different names depending on whether they're rejected, sublingual, oral. Oh, you know, it gets it does get rather complicated. So we'll just refer to them as the um, particular gland or organ. Okay. So of course, the adrenal glands they sit on top of the kidneys and they produce various hormones. They produce DHEA. They produce cortisol. They produce a, a strange one which I'd love to tell you about actually because it's another remarkable story uh, called aldosterone. Oh, was, that, sorry, was that aldosterone aldosterone sorry oh, yeah. yes, yeah. i'm very much familiar with that one that's my that's one of my lagging hormones <laughs> ah right cool very good <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> do you know the story about uh, hearing loss the hearing uh, well my yeah. grandmother she she doesn't have um very good hearing and i was starting to suspect her salt cravings could be linked to that yeah yeah yeah, yeah because actually that would imbalance the whole the whole play of the game that, that's yeah. very very true very very true people don't get enough potassium and magnesium almost across the board so i always recommend yeah get some potassium magnesium magnesium can be so easy because you can apply it as an oil or yeah. you know people get tired of swallowing tablets day in day out if you're on a big program you know it can be so i said well don't don't worry because with magnesium you can you can have an oil you can have a spray or hey how about putting it in the bath and climbing in the bath and having a nice chill in the bath for half an hour, you know, yeah. and, and, and absorb it that way. You, you won't even notice it. Um, and anyway, magnesium is one of my favorites because it, it can almost have, in, if you've got muscle cramps, if you have regular migraines, by taking enough magnesium, it will be gone in minutes, you know. Bill, because it my, my question for you is, can we have a peptide bath? <laughs> well, it's very funny you should say that because uh, in St. Petersburg, they have a clinic that applies the peptides and it's run by a lovely lady called Professor Svetlana Trofimova. And Svetlana, um, her clinic is called the Tree of Life. And it's in a lovely locale and it's in an old, there are more palaces in St. Petersburg than I think any other city in the world. And it's in one of these old former palaces, yeah. so you can imagine. And, um, but she does a number of treatments there. Now she specializes in eyes, actually. She gets very, very well-known people all around the world come. And I can tell you a little bit about that work because it is astounding, astounding. And it's using peptides. But strangely enough, she does peptide wraps. And when I was there last, she said, Phil, you have to come and experience some of it. So I went off to the room and was wrapped up, you know, it with various peptides. Uh, so yes, they, it's not a bath, I admit, but it's a wrap. <laughs> what, what do you mean by wrap? You mean? Well, they, 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 they the, the nurse puts the liquid peptides. It's a bit gel like all over your body. And then they wrap you in like a, um, what we call cling film. I think what Americans call saran wrap, yeah. um, you know, that sort of plastic stuff. They get, you get wrapped up. So you look like a, a in a cocoon and, <laughs> And then you're, it's heated and then you get warm and they leave you like that for an hour or two and then they unwrap you, you shower and 
that's you done for the day. Yeah. But they do different peptides. Now that's mainly aimed at skin. I'll admit yeah. that is mainly aimed at skin and all that. But they can introduce other peptides that way. Just very quickly, some of her work, um, they are the only um, uh, clinic in the world reversing certain eye disorders. Um, they do very well with macular degeneration, um, but there's a, there's a disorder called um, retinal pigmentosa and nobody else treats it, they treat it. And they have these computerized images of eyes and, on, and you see it in colors. So black is an area where the patient has no vision, nothing, right? Red is where they have very bad vision, yellow is poor, green is normal, okay? So obviously what you're trying to look at, you want to, this computerized topography, you want it to look all green. Mm. Well, I've seen results. Um, there was one lady went in there and she was 70, 70% blind in her eye. Now that, you know, when you've got people at the extreme end, it's very, very difficult to bring them up back to normal, okay? That's a, you know, it's, it's nearly true of everything in medicine. If you catch it early, you get a good result. If you leave it, if you leave Alzheimer's to this point, it's gonna be really hard to get them back in, the, in an okay zone. This lady was 70% blind. So really, what could be expected? Well, when they finish these peptide treatments, and I'll explain how they do it, because it's not that difficult, she was 30% blind, wow. but she had a significant improvement in the, in the eye. There were areas of the eye she could see normally. People who are like 30% blind, they come back to normal. That's how good it is. That's wow. how good it is. How do they apply those particular treatments? Well, they do inject. They inject them into the orbit of the eye. This is the area around the eye called the orbit. They do not inject them into the eye. Yes. They inject them subcutaneously and they do that for 10 days. They come in, it's like little pinpricks, and they just do that for 10 days, and then they give them the oral peptides to take home. And within three months, that three-month magic time again, that's when they come back and they, they do the scan again, and they go, well, this is... And the people know anyway, because, of course, they see better. They're reading eye charts better and all the rest of it. So they do really incredible work. Um, so, and they use a pineal, and they also use a retina, the retina uh, peptide. Okay. This is a very important one for eyesight. So, sorry, to come back to the adrenals, this is the kind of ticket here. If you know you have a weakness, so if you are that sports guy who's working out hard and really putting his body under a lot of stress, then yes, you're absolutely right. You are releasing cortisol because it exercises what is a kind of hormesis. Yep. That's the correct term. Which, which, and hormesis actually, which is the definition of mild stress is healthy because we all know if we do a bit of exercise, we feel better, we look better. But exercise is stress yeah. by definition. But how? But mild stress, hormesis, is healthy. It's when you go beyond. So now, if you're a marathon runner, you're putting yourself under extreme stress, okay? And some years ago, we had a machine which measured the uh, stiffness of arteries okay i'd love if we have time i'd love to tell you my my blood story because it, it's it's quite shocking um and um the machine measured the stiffness of arteries and we found that people who did extreme exercise like marathon runners all of them had two hard arteries would you believe that the russians did something similar they took some of their olympic teams now i'm actually in the middle of writing an article about this, which I hope to publish uh, late September. The, if you saw the picture of these beautiful 20-something-year-old, uh, young 20 girls, Russian girls, gymnasts, and we all, we all know what gymnasts look like, and you think, well, you couldn't be fitter than a gymnast, yeah. right? It's almost a perfect body, and so lithe and jumping about, and you think, my goodness me. So these, and they were the gold medal winners at London Olympics. Right. But they're the top of the game, yeah. the best in the world. So what the Institute did in St. Petersburg, they got these girls in and they measured their telomeres and they measured their adrenal output. And they were all shocking, shocking. They were all, they, they had the telomere lengths of 50 year olds. They, the average, you know, this, the concept of biological age. And, and they had, you know, the adrenal glands weren't operating properly. Over-exercise, 
it's too much without the protection. So in their cases, they started giving them peptides. And within about, guess how long? Three months, <laughs> everything came back to normal. And suddenly they had the telomere lengths of what their ages were. So they brought them back from this awful stage to this much better stage. Brilliant book out there, written by a friend of mine. His name is Dr. Richard Lippmann. Uh, lovely guy, an expert in free radicals, was nominated for the Nobel Prize in Medicine for his work uh, measuring in vivo, in humans. Found out lots of things in the 80s. He's got this book called Stay 40. In the book, he shows a bunch of people, middle-aged people, men and women, and they're all a bit flabby, they're all a bit in a bit of a mess, and they all decide to go and do a lot of aerobic exercise, okay? And fast forward a few pages in the book, you see these people again. Uh, previously, you saw them there standing head to toe in their underwear. Now, fast forward a few pages, you now see them, you see their body, but you don't see their head. And to a person, after a year, they all look better. They all look slimmer, trimmer, you know, think, oh, great, everyone's done really, really well, well done. And then he shows you their heads. To a person, they look 10 years older because they haven't protected themselves against this. They were doing nothing, suddenly they're doing a lot, and they didn't add any protective regimen to their program. So, for, for example, in this particular case, um, antioxidants. Mm. They weren't doing enough, let's put it that way. Mm. And so he's, he's saying, you know, you have to protect yourself. You, your body doesn't have the mechanism, especially as you get older, it doesn't have the mechanisms as it did when we were younger. So how are you protecting yourself? So there are, there are obviously different methods that we, you know, you can go in all sorts of directions with these things. So let's come to, if you know your weak spot, so if you know your adrenal glands are not performing properly, you can use the adrenal peptide to pick them up. Now, there's a really strange thing about peptides that is totally different to hormones. You could say, well, shit, Phil, I could just take some DHEA, I could take some aldosterone, I could take some cortisol even, you can take hydrocortisone, yeah, it's well known. And all my hormone levels will improve. Absolutely right, absolutely, 100% right. But you need to do two things. First of all, you should be monitoring your hormone levels because you don't want to overdo it. You, you might really cause some damage in some areas. You, you can even cause what's called, it doesn't happen with all hormones, but some hormones, down regulation. That is, let's say take the thyroid, for example. Yep. If you took too much thyroid medication, your thyroid gland may say, shit, this stuff's in the blood all day and night. I don't need it anymore. And it would stop making thyroid. And now you'd be stuck for the rest of your life taking thyroid medication. That's, that's a known fact. So, so if you're using most hormones, you should be prudent and you should go and get some blood work done and keep an eye on things. You don't have to do that with peptides because the gene is on or the gene is off. Now it's, it's going to annoy the guys who want to have super logical dosages of everything. The bodybuilders who want to have extreme testosterone because the peptide won't take you there. It will put you in the optimal normal zone. It is not going to take you up to this unbelievable zone. Okay. So those guys are not going to be too happy about it. But for most Joes out there, most people, you know, getting your hormone, getting your hormone levels nicely balanced and back where they work and have, huge improvements and the adrenal glands as you rightly say you know if you've got adrenal fatigue you will feel to use a british expression knackered <laughs> very tired <laughs> very tired exhausted you know you'll be probably napping at two or three o'clock in the afternoon you know life is just going to seem like a chore it really is strange thing about uh, i was told this by my friend walter pierre paulie who spent his life working with rats and mice as well and he said when we dissected a rat and we looked at their adrenal glands, we could tell whether it was a bully or whether it was bullied. I said, how? He said, because the bullies would have very small adrenal glands and the, the ones that were bullied had very big adrenal glands. Mm. And I said, why? He said, because if, if you're being bullied, you're going to be producing cortisol. You're going to be under stress. But the bully, he's not under stress. How about that? Yeah. So the great news is, if you are in this predicament, 
and you can use the, the adrenal peptide and it will it will balance all the adrenal hormones mm. right mm. and here's the big one here's here's the one that really blows a lot of people's minds why did they call them bioregulators what, what what's that about well if we were to take the thyroid gland in our neck again quite a large gland in the neck if we were to take that it's kind of butterfly shaped if we take that most people are hypothyroid it means they have too little in fact there's been estimates that um 30 percent 30 percent of the adult population is hypothyroid okay that's a shocking number isn't it yeah and of course what does the thyroid do it regulates our temperature our metabolism and other factors but people who rightly have cold hands cold feet that sort of thing they generally that because that was the old way of testing it before there were blood tests uh, they generally and also take your morning temperature if you wake up in the morning and you take you know you can get these thermometers they just put in your ear or whatever or put them on your forehead and drop down the number now i'm going to give it to you in celsius so i apologize for everyone who uses fahrenheit but you you can find a calculator that will do it um so if you are regularly below 36.4 degrees c you're probably hypothyroid okay some people may even get figures they might even be 35 that would be shockingly low but that happens if you're between 36.4 and 36.7 that's how unbelievably accurate our body wants to keep our temperature you're spot on you're spot on but there are people they're, they're, they're in the minority but there are people who are hyperthyroid they're too much thyroid now they can be off the chart they can be over 37 even higher sometimes you can spot hypothyroid people quite easily they normally have deer in the headlamp eyes uh the um famous picture in the louvre uh, the mona lisa they believe she was hypothyroid how about that because of the way she looks they also tend to have a lot of energy yeah and they're, they're burning up so they tend to be people who don't put on weight because their metabolism is constantly high yeah uh but they're kind of over the top kind of people you might be annoyed by them because they never seem to relax uh, i've known a few in my time um and but the thing about here's the here's the here's the thing about the regulators guess what they do if you're low they switch the gene on and bring you up if you're high they switch the gene off and bring you down they normalize and that is an incredible when i first i must tell you this i must sorry i must tell you this story I first learned about this work and Professor Cavinson, oh, I don't know, several years ago now. I forget about the time. And I went to a meeting in Istanbul and he was lecturing and I was sitting in the audience and I heard him explain all of this. And when and after his lecture, it was coffee break. So everybody left for coffee. And for the first time I sat there, I was stunned because a light bulb had gone off. I had an epiphany, you know, we don't, that doesn't happen very often in life, but I had one on that day. And I literally said to myself, either this is the most incredible story I've ever heard, or it's a load of bullshit. Because of course, then you don't know, you just don't know. And over the next two or three years, I got to know Professor Cavinson, I met him other times, I went to St. Petersburg. Then we started collaborating a bit on writing books and getting things into English and so on and so forth. And of course, now, now it's firmly in my head, of course. But it took me back to a moment when I was at college in London doing my food and vitamin technology course. And one day the professor, of course, we didn't have any PowerPoint then, he, he put up on the projector, he put up a pie chart. And, and this pie chart was broken into segments, of course. And he said, this is typically what you find in food. It's just an average, you know, it will vary from food to food but this is what you find in food and of course there was x percentage of vitamins x percentage of minerals x percentage of, uh, of fats and most of it like 60 percent or thereabouts was fiber and i had a thought that day and the thought was well either fiber is very important and remember in 1980 1981 people weren't thinking that much about fiber i know it's different now I thought, well, either fiber is a lot more important than we think it is because nature doesn't waste anything. So why is, why is there so much fiber in food? What, what, what other things could fiber be doing? And my second thought was, or oh, they've missed something. 
maybe there's other things in food that have significance. And that was the moment the light bulb went off for me in that first lecture. Peptides are in food, short chain peptides, and they're gene switches. They're another fundamental message from food to our body. That, uh, and there will be other things. I, I'm, you know, there is light in food, believe it or not. Uh, there is magnetism in food, and who knows what else is in food? These can all, these could, as far as I'm concerned, then I don't know about what they do. But nature doesn't waste anything. Everything is energy, and everything's there to be had. But the really exciting thing is this discovery of peptides. And now, as I say, they've, they've identified 21 different short chain peptides, each one of which is very specific gene switch that would help the pineal, that would help the adrenal, that would help the thyroid, that would help the thymus, many, 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 many different ones. So I hope I'm getting this conveying. I'm, I'm probably, I'm quite excited. I'm still excited about them. Yeah. And I believe they're the future. I believe that, you know, we've had the bioidentical hormone wave. You know, that's been a big thing now for, for, for two decades. And it will continue to be a big thing because hormones are powerful tools. You know, there's the strong tools in the box that we have. Mm. But peptides are a new kind of tool. And here's a really good thing. They're so safe that I actually am going out on a limb here. You don't need to do blood tests and you don't even need a medical professional involved. I'm not advocating that you do that, yeah. <laughs> but I'm just trying to convey that they are so safe mm. because they've been dosed in Russia and recorded over a million times. You know, 30, 40 years of, of research, nobody got any side effects. Nobody, mm. nobody. And they use them in combination. So if, you, if, you, if you're a kind of person that cost and convenience is no problem to you, you could take all 21 if you want to. It, it's not, apart from hurting your wallet, it's not going to hurt anything else. So um, they are quite remarkable, quite remarkable. So the, some of the studies you mentioned, because um, I was wanting to know if they were translated. Um, yes. Or if they were. Yes. Yeah, so where, are they... Most, not every single one. Yeah. Not every single one, because there's a lot. Yeah. But... There's seven clinical trials that have been translated of individual peptides. Right. And then the big trial, which is the one I mentioned earlier, which was this gas bomb, that's been translated. And then there's very specific trials. Uh, for example, there's one on proving that these short chain peptides were absorbed orally because originally they thought maybe they could only be used injected. But it didn't make sense because it comes out of food. So they did this big study to show that short chain peptides, peptides under six, six or under, amino acids are absorbed through the stomach wall. So just to, that makes just, sense. Because how does a bodybuilder, if a bodybuilder says I'm going to eat steaks and I'm going to eat salmon day and night because I want the protein, how does that work? Because we know proteins get destroyed in the stomach. So how does the bodybuilder put mass on by eating steaks, etc.? Yeah. Please explain it to me. Yeah. Well, the Russians have done it. What happens is the proteins are broken down in the stomach acid but the sh it broken down into some of the short chain peptides. The short chain peptides pass through into the blood and they induce protein synthesis. Yeah. Yes, there is a muscle peptide. Okay, so uh, I, think, <laughs> I, think, I think I came across that one. That's one I'm, I'd be interested to learn more about. But just, just to circling back one second, um, just back on the, the fact that they're found in foods, my initial assumption is that it will be found predominantly in animal-based products, right? When you when you say that is absolutely that is absolutely yeah. correct. Yeah. I mean, in this day and age, you can synthesize everything, yeah, and you can get these peptides synthesized. However, they do not behave in the same way, and that tells me that they're not exactly the same. Yeah. And this comes down to this mystery element. You know, if you look at it from a pure chemistry point of view, you would say that is exactly the same molecule. It's got exactly the same oxygen, hydrogen, da, 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 all the structure is exactly the same. But when you take something natural, there may be elements of it that we're not taking into account. I, I touched on too early. Light, you know, magnetism, other aspects. You probably know whenever anyone wants to diss vitamins, they always try and the, the studies they raise didn't work, didn't work, didn't work, wasn't used. Invariably, 
they are the synthetic vitamins. Try and find them with the natural vitamins. They invariably have the results. So, but a chemist would say, but these two molecules are exactly the same. So there's something else. So you're absolutely right. When it comes to the peptides, the ones that we chose to work with were the natural peptides, which do come, they're bovine, so they come from cows. Absolutely right. And let me put everyone's minds to rest here. The molecule is so small, it's not Dalton sized. So there's no way you can pass on any diseases from the animal. Having said that, animals that get used in uh, ph pharmacy to make drugs, as it were, are, are specially bred. They are not, you don't go down the farm and just get a couple of cows that are you know, going to be used for steaks. Um, they specially breed out. So they're in a more controlled, cleaner environment than an average farm. Right. But beyond that, when they extract these things, they pass through all kinds of filters. And I've seen the, the factory actually in St. Petersburg that does it. And it is an incredible, you know, it's a $20 million factory that, that, for the equipment in it, you know. Um, and but the molecule size is so small, you can't pass mad cow disease or anything like that through it. It's, it's, imp it's impossible, simply impossible. Um, so, yes, you're absolutely right. The best source is from meat. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, um, yeah, I'm definitely, I'm very excited to explore and even experiment with a few of those in particular, the, um, the glando caught the, the adrenal peptide. Cause we sort of spoke a little bit about the aldosterone. Do you want to, cause I know Ooh. that you also, that's a really rare one and a, a lot of people, it is. yeah, it is. It, you know, if you speak to most, um, endocrinologists about it, the, the main thing that they would use aldosterone for is, people who have balance problems, who prefer to lie down than stand up. They don't feel right standing up. And a lot of it is to do, as you alluded to, um, was it your mother earlier, but you were saying that there was a, too much sodium, yeah, too much salt in the diet, and, it's, it's, and it pulls down the potassium and the magnesium. You have to get that, that balance better. By the way, just a little side note, personal note for you. I wonder if she's using regular table salt, if she's using uh, you know, sodium chloride. Because sodium chloride, the pure white stuff, is not natural salt. If she was to use sea salt, yeah. uh, which if you look at sea salt, it's kind of gray, unless you're using Himalayan sea salt, which is kind of pink, but the, normally it's kind of gray, and it's kind of a little bit soft, a little bit soft, a little bit squidgy, and um, it's loaded with minerals, because it's not just sodium chloride. So I would suggest go and, go and get all her salt cellars and swap it out for you know, I know you have to grind it, but I mean, go and swap it out for the other stuff. And I wonder if it will really help her, actually, mm. really help her. But um, sorry, what were we saying about? We're talking about uh, yeah. little salt issue. So all those steroids. Yeah, so yeah. all those steroids. So the, here's the. So most endocrinologists would say it's a balance problem. It's patients who don't like to stand up, who prefer lying down, and we give them some all those steroids, and it addresses the sodium potassium balance. Yeah, it does. Um, but there was a 1940s it was discovered. And this goes back to my, you know, top of the webinar when I said, uh, you know, it, it, we've learned, we've learned, we, we've discovered it, but we haven't learned it. So uh, a brilliant doctor called Jonathan Wright, who's written many books. So he is a great, great doctor, has a massive clinic in Tahoma, Washington. I think he has like 200 doctors working under him. And he has teams of university students who do nothing more than go down to the libraries and dig out stuff. Because whether we like it or not, only about 10 or 20% of the world's information is online. We're still not there yet. We're still not there yet. So he sends them down and they find things. So something they rediscovered a few years ago was a 1940s clinical trial. And they found that people who had hearing damage um, you know, as long as they didn't have a physical problem in the ear, there was, there wasn't a physical problem, but they, they weren't hearing well, the volume was gone. Um, they found they were very low in aldosterone. So they decided <clears throat> to give the patient some aldosterone and almost to a person, the hearing came back to normal. Now, since then, we know why it turns out that the, the tiny um, hairs that are inside the inner ear. Of course, the air vibration comes in, and of course they vibrate. They, this is how they, you know, this is how, and that vibration 
sends a signal to the part of the brain for hearing. And guess what it uses? It uses all those stereo. Wow. It's part of the signal. So if you're naturally low in all those stereo, your hearing goes down. So what we've done, you can take all those stereo orally in a capsule, no problem. But we made a eardrop. So you literally, you put two drops, two or three drops into the ear, just leave it in there, put a bit of cotton wool, make sure it stays in for a few minutes, make sure it all gets in there. And the rest of the day, you've got good hearing. We actually had um, one doctor who had a problem with his hearing and he put loads too much in, he was putting too much in. And he then complained his hearing was too loud. So I said, well, use some earplugs. <laughs> no, his problem was he took too much dose. Yeah. He had to readjust his dose. Yeah. But it's kind of funny, isn't it, that you go yeah. from, from bad hearing to extreme hearing, and now you've got to, you've got to curtail it. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Okay, well, um, maybe we should segment into a little bit on some of the GHRPs, because um, I do have a very uh, athletic-oriented uh, audience, so maybe... Yeah, we can talk a little bit about even the even the nasal spray as well, the mm. A Alpha MSH as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, growth hormone, of course, HGH, human growth hormone, um, is a hot topic still, even since 1986 or nine, when Dr. Daniel Rudman produced that report on elderly people, showing that his his, his summing up was on average they had reversed their biological ages by 20 years. And that was based on, you know, the elasticity of their skin, the improvement in their muscle mass, the general well-being, all, all sorts of parameters, really dramatic. You know, you're 70 years old, but your biomarkers now show you 50. If that's not anti-aging, I, I want to know what is. And then, of course, Dr. Ron Klatz, who's the, one of the top guys at the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine, A4M, he produced a great book, uh, which was called Grow Young with HGH. And... There's actually a statement for me in that book uh, when I talk about IGF-1, which is, as you might know, is a byproduct of, of growth hormone, as it were, insulin-like growth factor. That still remains experimental. It was experimental then, and I think it's still experimental. I'm talking about IGF-1. Um, but a lot of people, of course, became very excited with human growth hormone, and rightly so, because if you inject subcutaneous injections of human growth hormone, and I'm talking about physiological dosages i'm not talking about superlogical dosages that maybe bodybuilders would use uh, because that of course puts you in a whole new territory um, within six weeks you can expect to see significant improvements uh, less less fat more muscle maybe even better eyesight maybe even a, a more hair growth there's a, a more well-being more energy there's there's a whole bunch of things the problems, of course, I you know I told you earlier that if you inject growth hormone, you 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 increase this. It's not bioidentical. So the nice thing, the first nice thing about the peptides that you can use, and there are there are two. Well, actually, there are three, uh, and I'll, I'd like to tell you about semorelin or semorelin, whichever way you want to say it, um, because it is unique. It is unique. But the principal two that are used today are GHRP six, growth hormone releasing peptide six, and two. GHRP2. Um, now, the interesting thing is that there have been a study on GHRP2, and it is effective sublingually. So that's that's nice news. If you want an easy way to take something, GHRP2, pop it under the tongue, it works. GHRP6, of, of course, they all work injected. They all work injected. But GHRP6, uh, the sublingual route is not good. Uh, I think if you were thinking about GHRP6 and you didn't want to inject, then look at a nasal spray. That's, that's, that's the, typically a nasal spray is the second best route to blood. Yeah. You know, injection obviously is number one, uh, sub um, uh, intranasal is number two, uh, and then somewhere between transdermal in some cases and sublingual is three. And a long way down after that is oral. But these, these particular peptides, don't work orally. They're too long. The, the amino acid chain is too long. So both GHRP2, GHRP6, uh, GHRP6 intranasal, GHRP2 sublingual will raise in a physiological way across the board growth hormone. So that we know that the studies are there, they do work. 
it is not as strong as taking growth hormone injected. Remember, growth hormone is 191 amino acids. That's one heck of a long chain, okay? But of course, in most countries, let's be honest, growth hormone is also a controlled substance. This is beyond prescription. If you are in possession of a controlled substance without a prescription, you could be facing a felony, okay? Even though you might say, well, I've only got one, but it could happen. If you are in possession, I can't speak for Australia, but I'm talking, but you're under common law, so it's pretty similar to the UK yeah. and Europe. So uh, we share the same queen. And uh, <laughs> yeah, Freddie Mercury, no, I'm joking. Um, and, um, but if you uh, have a prescription item, let's say you've got a packet of metformin and you don't have a prescription, the worst thing that's gonna happen is they're gonna say, stop it. You know, you're, you're, you're very unlikely to be in court. But I'm saying, but I'm just saying something like growth hormone, because it's, you know, they put it in this category, they call it controlled substance. So here's the good news. Growth hormone releasing peptides are not controlled substances. Yep. Right? So that is, you know, from a, I'm talking now from a legal, I'm not talking yeah. about biochemistry now, of course, yeah, I'm talking yeah. about from a legal perspective. So that can take the heat off mm. anyone that might be interested in going down a route like this. Now, both GHRP2 and GHRP6 are what's known as agonists. And that simply means that they stimulate, in this particular case, the pituitary gland to release growth hormone. Okay, that's what they are. But there is a, and of course the opposite to that is an antagonist, which would prevent release of, but they're not that. Um, now, the, there is a weird one, and the weird one is semirelin. And semirelin is the precursor to growth hormone. It actually is 29 amino acids. It's the very beginning of it. Again, it can be used sublingually. Uh, it's okay, but it's best used intranasally or injected. Now, here's the weird one. Now, I'm, what I'm referring to now is the work of a guy called, a fabulous guy, Dr. Richard Walker. Okay, he's based in Florida. Uh, there are a couple of videos of me interviewing him on YouTube, and um, he's, he's a real expert in this area, real growth hormone expert, and he studies extreme aging. He, he, described, he, 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 he studies those poor kids with progeria and, and all those weird aging diseases, very rare, thank you. Oh. And um, he told me that the thing about semirelin there's a weird thing in the pituitary gland. Let me just take a step here. There's a weird thing in the pituitary. If we were to draw a graph of age on the bottom and the amount of growth hormone in blood on this axis, we would see that past the age of 35, there was a dramatic decline, very dramatic decline, until it gets down to a very, very low level. And you think, oh gosh, okay, so we need to stimulate growth hormone certainly past the age of 35. Yeah, okay, it's, it's viable argument. But here's the crazy thing. When they do autopsies, they find copious amounts of growth hormone still within the pituitary band. So the mechanism of release seems to be affected. And this is what makes semirelin, according to the work of Dr. Richard Walker, so interesting. It doesn't appear to act as an agonist. It doesn't stimulate more production of growth hormone from the pituitary it appears to act as the mechanism to release it into the blood. So if you take semirelin, you're not going to encourage your pituitary gland to make more, but you will still see an increase in blood levels because whatever's in there is coming out. And guess what? He said to me that if you combine a GHRP with semirelin, you will see a five to seven time increase in growth hormone levels. There is a fantastic synergy between these two. Without injection. Without injection. That's the whole point. Wow. That's phenomenal. Yeah, I've, I've, I've had a few friends in my circle that have experimented with the semirelin. Um, and yeah, but all, all for like bodybuilding purposes. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah sure. And obviously it would enhance recovery, improve muscle growth and enhance deep sleep as well. Another aspect. Um, what about appetite? Yeah. Uh, like to work out a bit, a big time, and you can look at me and say it doesn't. It's not me. 
Um, <laughs> but they really pushed themselves. I mean, I, I read a book about Arnold Schwarzenegger once, and uh, mm. he used to take a bucket with him into the uh, gym because he'd know he'd be he'd, he'd hit such an extreme level, and it was growth hormone actual release as well going on. He'd have to vomit. He, he'd always he'd, he'd push himself so hard he was vomiting at the end of it. Uh, well, that's extreme, extreme, of course. But the pain that people have in their muscles uh, prior, you know, after to uh, sorry, prior post um, extreme exercise is lactic acid. It's the accumulation of lactic acid, and either the athlete, etc., is going to have to stop or not work as hard or stop the whatever it is. It's it's going to impede or have a horrible day maybe well you can block lactic acid production by using a dipeptide called l-carnosine okay you know you're not carnitin yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm familiar with carnitine you know. yeah, yeah yeah so if you if you use some carnitine uh, uh, before a workout and also take some after a workout you will be a most of the guys who take 500 milligrams to a gram, I would suggest, of carnosine uh, 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 pre-workout will work out a lot longer. Eventually, of course, the lactic acid will come through, but they all say, my God, I did another half an hour or whatever it was. And then if you take it at the end, the effects will be negated and will go away a lot faster. So carnosine is very helpful for those guys who, who are doing uh, he heavy exercise. Yeah, awesome. Um and did you want to sort of touch on a little bit about the alpha MSH? Yeah, sure. Now, this is a, a bit of a weird one, uh, MSH, uh, melatonin-like stimulating hormone. Mm. Um, there's a fantastic book written by my medical director, Dr. Wardeen, called Biological Age Measurement. And it was his magnum opus, and he wrote it in the late 80s. And it's still a brilliant book even today, if you're, if you're into this. He went around the world collecting data and he wanted to see hormone responses, right? What, not only what happens to hormones from the age of, say, 20 to the age of 80, how, what, where would they be? But also, what happens to a hormone 24 hours? Because that's called chronogeriatrics, mm. terminology for it. But there's still not enough known, because it's difficult. You've got to take blood from someone at three o'clock in the morning and five o'clock in the afternoon. And you can imagine to see where these different ones, but MSH is a weird one because it, most hormones decline as we age. Some like cortisol and prolactin increase. They're very rare though. Most decline. MSH is a flat line. It's, it's what it's almost a flat line. It's very strange. Now the first and foremost, a tribute to MSH is it tans people. It will make light skinned people darker. Absolutely hands down. Now you have to inject it or you have to use it as a nasal spray. This will not work orally. Okay. Um, so that's going to happen. Uh, some people love that idea and it will keep tanning and tanning and tanning and tanning and tanning and tanning. A friend of mine who was a Caucasian uh, like me uh, and um, he, uh, he he looked like an Indian at the end of it. But you don't get fixed in that position. If you stop taking it or you reduce the dose, your skin will start to come back. So it's not a kind of case of I turn black and I stay black. So that's, that's moving in that direction. Mm. Uh, because it has a direct action on uh, uh, the melasinonite, which are the, you know, we all know if we go out in the sun, we'll get a bit of a glow, get a bit yeah. of a tan. Well, that's, a, that's the same reaction. But when you use MSH, your entire body tans. And it doesn't matter if you go out in the sun or not. Okay? Your entire body tans. Right? So, and I do mean everywhere. <laughs> I'll leave that to your imagination. <laughs> awesome. um, there's a weird story here. There is an opposite one. There is an antagonist. And it was developed by a guy called Professor Christopher Hewitt from the University of Arizona. And he told me some stories, but unfortunately, there's a really bad. So what does it do? It turns dark people lighter. Now, that would be an enormous success in the Far East. I don't know if you know, but Japanese women want to be lighter. Yeah. Thai women want to be lighter. It's almost the opposite. I can't speak for Australia, but it's almost the opposite. In, in, in my culture, 
a tan is a good thing yeah. because it shows you have leisure time. It yeah. shows that you have maybe have an outdoor job and that would be nice. In the Far East, and I can speak on this because my, my wife is Thai and I spend a lot of time in Thailand. So, you know, um, in the Far East, they all want to be lighter. Why? Because it shows you've got an indoor job. You're not stuck outside in the burning heat all the time. <laughs> yeah, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence, right? Every, every society. So there is an opposite one, but unfortunately it has a really nasty side effect, which is stomach cramps. Um, actually, Dr. Hewitt actually told me he thought that's what um, Michael Jackson was using. Really? Because, yeah, yeah, he thought he, was, he thought he had access to it and was yeah. using it. Uh, but if he was, he was putting up with stomach cramps every day. But and maybe that's why he took a load of other drugs to try and negate that. Who knows? I don't know. I don't know. But um, but MSH, come back to MSH, it will tan light-colored people. Okay. Now, it doesn't work uh, for people, and it doesn't work particularly well for me, if you are in the lowest three classes of Caucasian skin. And so if you have Scandinavian blood or something like that in you, if you're blue-eyed, if you've got red hair, it probably won't work very well for you. And normally, you, if you look very carefully at your own skin, if you've got little, I've got a couple on my forehead, you won't see it here, but tiny little red spots. And that normally is an ind indicative that you are in the lowest classes. Won't work very well, but you know that already, because if, even if I go to have a holiday in Barbados, I'll go red. I never go brown. I, it doesn't matter how long I stay out there. So MSH will only take you to that position. But that's only a small percentage of people, right? That's not most people. So everyone else will darken. But it does more than that. It, it, it's not, all hormones do multiple jobs. You know, there's, there's no one hormone that just does one thing. It, it's involved in different areas. So what you have with, um, what you have with MSH that's known, a couple of interesting things. It stimulates the libido. People feel hornier taking MSH men and women and that's unusual because normally it doesn't there's, there's not much that works on women in that regard oxytocin does that's mm -hmm. another hormone but mostly that doesn't happen dopamine works see men are driven by dopamine and women are generally driven by serotonin and they're quite different kind of hormones different kind of reactions you give women you give men dopamine or you don't give them dopamine you give them l-dopa or you give them deprinol or things like that and they will generally tell you, oh, yeah, I definitely, oh, I definitely feel horny. I definitely, you know, put my leave it. You give it to women, they don't get that effect. But MSH is one of the few that can stimulate libido in women as well as men. Right. The other thing it will do for a man is it will improve an erection. It, it will have a firmer erection with MSH. We don't really know why, but there, that is a noted effect of MSH use. What about the what about the yawning? The what this what is yawning? The, the yawning. I've heard that it can stimulate yawning and like have you heard about that? No, I haven't. I I haven't come across that. No, no. Yeah. Not to say it, but I depend I guess you'd have to ask how was it administered and how much was taken. Yeah, yeah. Uh, from the from the usage I've seen, which is reasonably mild, you know, um, I've not heard that as a side effect. Okay. But maybe if you take enough, it would start doing something like that. Yeah, I've seen a I've seen a, a weird phenomenon where um, somehow there's a, a link between yawning, the triggering of a, a yawn, and an erection at the same time. It's some weird dopamine uh, phenomenon. The only thing I know in that regard, and it's a, the old classic, and there's lots of jokes about it, is you know you make love to your lady friend and um, and after it's all over, shall we say, um, uh, she still wants, you know, as an old, the old joke, you know, the, the, the worst word a man wants to hear again, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> the prolactin. Well, you know, um, the prolactin and, uh, and the lady often, sometimes anyway, wants to do it again as soon as possible. And the man actually wants to go to sleep. He's tired. Yeah. And the reason for that is after you ejaculate, prolactin levels go up yeah shoot up in a man and we think that's the link and it's like oh i'm finished you know uh yeah. so we, i know that and that would of course also lead to yawning <laughs> yeah 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 
you mentioned um, some other dopamine agonists. Um, did you also list cabagolin as well? Or uh, no, it is a drug, of course, and it does do it. it, it yeah. In fact, it's the I believe cabagolin is the only one that uh, blocks both the uh, enzymes. It's monoamine oxidase A and monoamine oxidase B. Uh, we like Deprinel, which is which is a drug as well. Yeah. Um, it's also uh, known as selegiline. Um, oh, yeah, and it only blocks monoamine oxidase B, um, which is a, it has a number of factors in being safer. But dopamine works extremely well in men. But now we're really talking, yes, libido, but, but for men, older men, they get their focus, they get their drive, they get more mental acuity. Mm. And so, and, and that happens in hours. Yeah. You know, this is what we used to call in pharmacology a wow factor. You know, and, and that's what people expect from drugs, right? You've got a pain, you take a painkiller. You don't expect the pain to be there half an hour later. You know, and, yeah. and of course, some people, they look at nutrition and they expect it to operate in the same way. Mm. And of course, it doesn't. But it gets to the fundamental core. Some of the drugs are only treating the symptoms. Mm. You block the pain, but the pain hasn't gone away. Yeah. The fact that you've broken your arm hasn't, hasn't fixed the arm, has it? So, I mean, you know, we've, we've got to put these things in. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not knocking one side or the other side here. You know, I've always said that there is a happy medium. We, we don't want to suffer with pain. So, of course, we're going to take a drug to, to block the pain. Yeah. But in the long term, you've got to fix the problem. Then you have to do that in a different way. So everything has its role. And I've also said, you know, some people, they only want to use everything natural. And I said, so if tomorrow they invented a pill that would stop your aging right now, or perhaps wonderfully would reverse it, and, and you, you know, let's say you'd stay in this condition now, guaranteed for another 50 years, you wouldn't take it because it's a drug? Hmm, okay. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's their individual choice. I'm not here to force anything on anybody. Yeah. But I think we have to keep an open mind on both sides of the equation. For sure. And very often, they work very well combined. And that's the problem with medicine today, especially the kind of socialist medicine we have with the NHS and that. They are not keen to incorporate nutrition with drugs. And yet if they did, the effects would be much better, much better. I would have to agree there. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right, well, that pretty much, I guess we're, we've pretty much covered um, almost everything I wanted to. Um, so what I'll do, Phil, um, for my listeners, they're going to obviously want to know um, where to purchase these products and, um, and things like that. So I'm in the process of setting up um, an affiliate, an affiliation with, with Jane. Yeah. So my listeners right. can, um, I'll be linking everything in my show notes for, for those to, to find the products. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to say a massive thank you for, for sharing, welcome. sharing all your wisdom and um, thank you, you know, for your yeah, yeah, yeah. This is um, an area that I'm, I'm very passionate about um, and can definitely see myself utilizing these as therapeutic tools um, Great. moving down the line. So um, was there any, anything else you wanted to mention at all today, Phil? Um, I'm just trying to um, think of where... Oh, you wanted to talk about Baloki, didn't you? Um, oh, yeah, do, yeah. Do, do you want to just touch on that for a the minute? Lumber, or two? Lumber uh, yeah, yeah. This also leads me to a story I promised you, uh, which was about blood. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, Baloki is a trade name for um, an enzyme that is known as lumbrokinase, and it comes from earthworms. This, this stuff comes from earthworms. And of course, earthworms are strange creatures because, you know, hey, they don't get blood clots, right? They don't have heart attacks. They don't, <laughs> you know, and this, the weird thing, of course, you know, if you, when you were a kid, you cut, cut a worm in half and it would carry on. Both, both halves would carry on and they mate with themselves and they are quite extraordinary things. But this lumbrokinase, which is found in, in them, in their uh, blood, I suppose, um, there's, and there's been loads of studies. There's been dozens and dozens of human studies with lumbrokinase and they're quite exciting. I would go as far as to say that it is the best blood thinner on the market. Okay. Now, so what? Big deal. Who cares? Um, the thing about keeping your blood thin, in other words, not having viscous blood, is 
the fact that that the um, sorry about that. My gardener seems to have started work outside. <laughs> if you can hear the uh, lawnmower going, um, but the uh, there was a fantastic book written a few years ago by a Dr. Kenneth Kenzie. He was a cardiologist, American cardiologist. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us. And the book was called The Blood Thinner Cure. And he evaluated all of the blood measurements that are normally take. Everything from cholesterol to triglycerides to, you know, von, von Willebrand's and all sorts of blood markers and things that they take. And his conclusion was that the two most important things that everyone should do, and they were head and shoulders important over every other measurement you could take, including cholesterol, and that's a long story we can do another time, um, is how thick is your blood and how hard are your arteries? And his conclusion was, if you have thin blood and soft arteries, your risk of a heart attack or stroke are virtually zero. Mm. Now, is there any evidence for that? Well, yes, there is. It turns out that men up to the age of approximately 50 are twice the risk of a heart attack or stroke than a woman. But after the age of 50, a woman catches a man up and actually can even overtake him in terms of risk. So what on earth is that? What, that is obviously clearly something going on there. So what happened? Why is a woman half the risk of a heart attack of us up to the age of 50? And then after 50, they catch us up and even overtake us. What is that? It's a little thing called menopause. Because what does a woman do every month you know, before she, she gives blood? she gets rid of some of her blood. Now that does two things. You could argue it gets rid of toxins. And this actually even takes us back to the medieval time where they used to do bloodletting. It was popular to, to release some of your blood. Of course, they went to extremes and killed people, but actually the concept of losing a little blood on a regular basis, like a woman does when, when she's on a menstrual cycle, is actually very healthy. Is there any other evidence that supports this claim? Well, guess what? If you, as a man, go and donate a pint of blood every six months, you halve the risk of your heart attack or stroke. How simple is that? What other ways can we do to keep our blood thin? We can consume enzymes, and a good one is lumbricinase, is mm -hmm. bloke. It will help to keep your blood thin. And that has consequences, especially for organs that have very small arteries, mm -hmm. the eyes, the ears. So people on lumbrokinase can see an improvement in eyesight, can see an improvement in hearing, even helping tinnitus, you know, this constant mm -hmm. ringing in the ears. And, it's, and it can also significantly help against senile dementias. More and more people are saying that all these dimensions, dementias have one thing in common, vascular issues. Is the blood getting to that part of the brain, that part of the brain, that part of the brain. If it is, it's delivering nutrition, it's taking away toxins. Mm. So something like lumbricanase can have a very broad improvement that all of us help us keep our blood, stop it from becoming viscous, stop it from becoming thick. And on a simplistic level, just think of the heart as a pump. If a pump has to move a glutinous liquid around, it has to work a lot harder, right? It works nice and easy. If the, if the liquid is thin. So that, that's the benefit of something like, uh, like the Loki. Yeah. You've just, um, you've, you've prompted me to, to actually ask you a question about anything on, um, supporting mitochondrial function. What, what do you have in that realm? Right. Right. Well, that of course is a big topic. And, yeah. um, the, of course there's a whole theory of the mitochondrial theory of aging. It's declined. Mm. And I always liken, uh, old mitochondria are like government uh, because they, they get fatter and they get more inefficient and that's a fact and they get although there's one difference between government and mitochondria uh, mitochondria as they get older they get fewer in number whereas we get more and more government bureaucrats so <laughs> but seriously if you look at a young person's mitochondria they're small they're efficient if you look at an old person's mitochondria yes they're fewer in number and they're literally bigger and less efficient yeah. that, that's a fact but of course there's a number of different chains that are feeding you've got the electron transport chain the Krebs cycle they're all part of this mitochondrial cycle 
and a lot of agents are involved here if you look at those if you look at those diagrams you see a lot of b vitamins are involved okay so it's always a good thing to keep plenty because it's about methylation by the way you know that every single hormone in our body is made from cholesterol yeah right it's just how our mm -hmm. diet methylates it so if we have a bad diet and we're not methylating it to the required hormone the only thing the body can the only thing the liver can do is make more cholesterol mm -hmm. that's one of the theories about high cholesterol it's actually just a methylation problem it's, it's it's just the body trying to react to say hey we need more testosterone or we need, yeah. need, need more estrogen and i can't make it because that idiot isn't eating enough b vitamins you know uh, or something like that but um um but the mitochondria there are two or three agents that are very significant i would say uh and will give almost an instantaneous lift for most people one is coq10 coenzyme q10 there is a more efficient version of that now which is called pqq if you want it, if you're the kind of guy that wants to go to the top of the tree. Mm. And um, the other one I would uh, talk about is NADH. And you should look at the work of George Berkmeyer from Austria if you want to see very, very, very good product. And in most people, they'll get an instant physical energy improvement. Right? Mm. Like, again, sublingual doesn't work already. Yeah. So they're, they're three very good products I would suggest for or mitochondria but you know that's why b12 works people take a sublingual b12 and they feel better particularly the ladies um it's an improvement to mitochondrial mitochondrial production the mitochondria of course is like a dual-edged sword because they're using oxygen they're trying to convert glucose oh, i remember this correctly now they try a healthy aerobic they'll try and convert one glucose into 36 molecules of atp that's a perfect working mitochondria and they're using oxygen and of course oxygen is a dual-edged sword because it's yeah. also a radical. So they get damaged by trying to do the work they do. Mm. So, um, but they're organelles, mitochondria, and you find them in every tissue, every organ. And of course, the theory is that we, millions of years ago, these were not part of us and that we absorbed them and mm. that we've been work symbiotic. We've been working with them ever since. Mm. Um, and of course, they have one other very strange thing, mitochondria. Their mitochondrial DNA only come from our mother. They're the only thing in our body that didn't come from dad. They're just from mum. So, uh, so that they are very unique and at the same time very important. Because unfortunately, let's say our mitochondria are failing in our liver, and let, and they can't go to the kidneys, let's say, and share. They don't do that. So every organ, every tissue, every gland relies on its own healthy mitochondria very very important absolutely well um yeah i guess that will pretty much wrap it up here phil we're gonna have to do a another episode maybe sometime in the future because there's still yeah, so absolutely. much more that we've got to cover um yeah. i'm sure there's other there might, might be some other things in the pipeline that you're currently working on that, that i should i should know about um yeah 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 as always always something coming along and of course we're always learning more yeah. about the things we already know you know it's, it's not a case of discovering it and never finding out anything else about about things but i would definitely say keep your eye on the peptides this i think is going to be the next big wave that will take us through at least another 10 years and beyond um because you know and fundamentally of course they're stimulating the stem cell response you know through this that's another thing i forgot to mention um, so they've got so many aspects to them and the safety profile, I, I can't speak for every single peptide, but the peptide bioregulators to date have an incredibly good safety profile. Yeah. So as the Hippocratic Oath says, first do no harm, Yep. meet that criteria. Love it. <laughs> I love it. Well, um, we'll wrap it up here, Phil, but thank you. Thank you so much for um, coming on board. I really, really enjoyed today's show and I think my audience are going to absolutely love today's episode. Well, I, I, I'm very pleased to hear that. I hope so, because it's hard to guess how what people want to hear and, and how, dare I say, how to pitch it. I don't want to sound like a salesman, but you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. All righty. Well, thanks, everyone, for listening in. And um, I look forward to sharing this uh, this episode with you all. I'll be linking all of the um, the products and even Phil's, a couple of Phil's books in the show notes for you guys to explore. Um, so, yeah, again, thanks, Phil. and. Um, I'll speak to you soon. You're welcome. Good day. <laughs>
Thank you everyone for joining in to today's episode. For in-depth show notes and lessons learned, visit nofilter.media forward slash boost your biology. This has been a No Filter Media production. Say what you want.